Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, you should know right off the bat that God accepts nothing less than perfect faith and obedience. And if this makes you nervous, or if hearing the gospel reading today made you a little nervous, then you, like me, are a sinner, prone to trust yourself and your ability above God's grace. And this is what's making you nervous. But my job here is not to tell you you should be nervous alone. It is also to let you know that God has made you perfect in your baptism. Perfect. And he continues to do so as you hear his holy word. He forgives you and he keeps you in his gospel day in and day out so that you will trust him above everything else in this life, even above good things like family. For God has chosen you. Amen. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the well-known Lutheran pastor and resistance leader in Nazi Germany, wrote this. He said, when Christ calls you, he bids you to come and die. Now, those aren't real rosy words of encouragement, are they? You're probably not going to hear those at many rallies in our day. They're not encouraging, at least not on first blush, but there is a promise embedded there in what Bonhoeffer is saying. It is that God does not leave you dead. It is true, you will die, but God does not leave you dead. And Paul powerfully reminded us of this in Romans 6 this morning. But the bold face print in such a statement is that when you are called by Christ, as you have been called, you are called to die in the work of sharing the gospel one way or another. And Bonhoeffer, of course, wasn't the originator of this thought. Jesus himself said as much. And he said it even bolder still to his disciples and to us. You may remember last week, Jesus preached, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Why are they so few? When the harvest is right there, ready, ears ready to hear the gospel. Why are there so few laborers? Well, it's because of what Jesus says next, and we get a taste of that this morning. It's because if they persecute Jesus himself, they will, they will persecute the disciples and all Christians. And so we learn that all of the disciples but one were martyred for their preaching of the gospel. Not a real rosy picture for the work of the church. In Contarelli Chapel in Rome, there are two paintings by the master Caravaggio, and they hang opposite of each other in that chapel. The first is called The Calling of St. Matthew, which shows Matthew, the writer of our gospel, uh, for this year and for this morning, being called out of his work as a tax collector by Jesus into the work of telling others about Jesus. And think of all the people that have heard the gospel, not only from the preaching and the life work of St. Matthew, but because of the gospel that bears his name, and now this includes you, you are included in this group. Yet the painting opposite of the calling of St. Matthew is called the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And it depicts Matthew's life being taken by those who represented the king of Ethiopia. Matthew went to Ethiopia and preached and baptized as Jesus had commanded. But the king of Ethiopia did not want his people baptized as Christians. Sharing the gospel is risky business and Matthew lost his life as did the other disciples on account of it. And Jesus knew this. He did not gloss over this. Sharing the gospel is risky because in the gospel of Christ, we are giving something over more precious and more valuable than anything else in the world. And that is not hyperbole. That is truth. Think of all of the security that surrounds Fort Knox and all of its gold. Think of the security necessary in places of authority like Washington, D.C. 
now know that the promise given through the gospel that you are receiving, even today, is worth far more than anything in Fort Knox, far more important than any decision made in Washington, D.C. And when it is received, this promise of Christ makes believers know that there is nothing in the world worth more than what Jesus has already provided for them, for you. This does make Christianity risky and dangerous for those in the world who would otherwise want to have such power over you. To have your heart is to have you. And when Jesus has your heart and your trust, then nothing else in the world can hold you. And so I tell you now, you who are in Christ, there is nothing in the world that holds you other than Jesus so perhaps in this light, we can make more sense of the second half of the gospel reading that maybe was a little troubling as you heard the words. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. How do we make sense of these words? Now, Jesus is not giving license to believers just to go out and create a ruckus or violence. But he is saying that when the gospel is preached in the world, there are powers and authorities that will be rightfully displaced. And this will cause dissension in the world. But finally we know that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. We confess this in the creed. And that when he does, there will be final, lasting peace. Not on account of our work, Though we must work for this, we are commanded to preserve and protect our neighbors. And so we will be used up in this work. But final peace, lasting peace will come on account of Christ alone. And so even something as valuable as family, which God values highly. In fact, God designed this family structure and gives it to us as a gift. Even this will not provide the peace and security that Jesus does in his gospel. And so Jesus teaches here what it means to honor father and mother, but not to worship them. To honor family, children, those around us, even government, but not to worship them. There is a distinction that Jesus is making here. And I have to say that as a father, this is a hard teaching for me, it's very easy for me when I look at my children to begin to put my trust in them, in the fact that they must be protected and given a future. It's a powerful drive. But actually Jesus here is freeing us as parents, not into complacency, but freeing us to know that only he deserves worship. Yes, he will use us as family to protect each other, to love each other, to be sacrificed for each other even. But peace will not come on account of our family. It will come on account of Christ. In its right, in its right place now, family will provide the foundation for children to hear the gospel itself. And church is part of that structure. And finally, we will have a place to learn and trust God's word here too. And that word is a good one. It is that you who are baptized have been baptized into the death of Christ. So there is nothing that can hurt you now. And so Jesus, in the midst of this difficult teaching, tells his disciples, fear not. And I tell you, fear not. Because you who have been baptized into Christ's death are also baptized into his resurrection. And so you have a perfect and unperishable promise. It is worth far more than anything else in this world. It is yours, and you now belong to Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our hymn of the day. <laughs>